to you for uh, being a part of the program. And so um, by way of background, if I could, Veronica is a fiduciary, um, meaning that uh, you know, it is her job to give you the best possible uh, uh, financial wealth and uh, uh, advice um, that is completely independent, right? She doesn't mm -hmm. gain, uh, gain any benefit, uh, meaning commissions or anything along those lines from referring you to one product or another which makes her the ideal uh, financial and wealth manager um, assistant in the, in the universe. And she's also part of, I think, the largest um, uh, organization of fiduciaries. Um, and, and the name eludes me. Um, it's Cap Trust. Cap We're Trust. the largest fiduciary and registered investment advisor in the country. Yes. So um, Veronica it has come to us today to talk a little bit about um, the recent changes um, to uh, the individual stimulus programs under uh, the uh, recent changes, the CARES Act uh, and Family First Act. And uh, it, she is tremendous in this space and I just wanna thank her for being on here. But before we get into the substance, Veronica, let me ask you a question. What's present for you as we sit here today in this very different world? <laughs> Uh, what's most present for me is all of the opportunities that uh, the um, stimulus package or better known as the CARES Act has actually created across the board for financial planning. There's also, with everything that's going on, um, a lot of financial planning opportunities for clients, you know, just making sure from the basics, you know, making sure their wills that are in order. Life insurance is probably more important than ever, especially for people who are frontline workers um a lot of what's present and, and like i said the opportunities so a lot of it has to do with you know now's the best time in history to do a roth conversion some of these simple things and just seeing where we can find sort of the the golden light uh middle of the crisis for for clients and for everybody else that is beautiful so let me ask you um let me ask you this question um yes you know, you have a lot of uncertainty now and you represent, um, you know, businesses and, and individuals, um, high value, medium value, low value. Uh, you know, have you found that the uncertainty amongst people is universal or do you find that it's more concentrated with certain types of people in your experience with, with your own clients? Um, I would say the, the uncertainty from that perspective is definitely widespread. Everyone is just kind of trying to figure out what, you know, what do I do? What should I do? What should I be doing right now? What's, di you know, what's different? What's the opportunity for me here? Um, those are the biggest things. There are definitely clients, you know, who are closer to retirement, let's say, where this is way more worrisome for them than it is for people like me and you, for instance. Sure. Sure. So let me ask you this question. Um, what is going on? Like, what is, tell me just broadly, what is, what is this individual stimulus? What is it designed to do? What's its purpose? Right. So the individual stimulus is designed on across a number of things. Mainly it's to help small businesses and help individuals. There's obviously a large section, as we all know and have heard on the news, that's designed for bailout programs for certain companies and industries like the airline space and things like that that has lots of limitations on it. But mostly it's, it's to keep people employed. Like if I had to really sum it down to... Um, to you know a very quick thing it's to keep people employed and help small businesses keep people employed and for those businesses that have no other option but to close their doors to have people keep earning an income through unemployment programs you know a lot of what's being talked about during the stimulus is this twelve hundred dollar check or twenty four hundred dollar check that everybody's getting that's such a minor relatively part of the program and, and everybody's getting who's getting it is getting a one-time check you know a lot of people thought it would be there's some frequency to it but it's only one um, and the, the real expansion is unemployment. You know, if you look at New York, the highest amount of unemployment that's currently being paid out, the most you could earn is $504 a week. And the stimulus package is adding 600 to it. So it's more than doubling what people currently receiving unemployment are getting. That's huge if you're in that position. It's also expanding it for everyone who's 1099 or self-employed to be, to be eligible. Like all of these things are massive shifts in, in also how we approach unemployment in general, because before to even qualify for unemployment, 
we have to, uh, we had to, um, you had to be actively seeking work. If you're a 1099 independent contractor, that's hard to prove, right? So just expanding the program to those types of people of self-employed individuals is huge in terms, in terms of that. And then for small businesses, the SBA loans and really focusing on giving loan forgiveness just to people who keep up with their payroll and don't let go of people is also, I think, a massive shift in how we view loans in general because it's more people focused and not revenue focused, right? They're not saying that businesses with the highest revenue over the last year get a lower rate loan. They're actually saying, hey, you get the lowest rate loan if you keep 100% of your employees employed. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So let's take that in pieces, right, to really dissect that because um, for, you, for you and me who have been living this for, mm -hmm. you know, probably the last th two or three weeks, for us, you know, that was pretty easily digestible. But for the average person who's just watching, you know, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and they're getting, you know, their, their information from bite-sized, you know, pieces, I think going, drilling down into some of those um, things is, is really important. So let's start with the individual stimulus, right? When I talk about individual stimulus, I'm talking about the, the one-time checks as you refer to them. So, so who exactly gets these checks, right? These, these individual stimulus checks. So basically for the full $1,200 check per individual, you have to earn in 2018 on your taxes or 2019 if you've already filed your adjusted gross income. Very, very clearly, I wanna make sure everyone knows, it's your adjusted gross income, so you, you have to find that on the line because that's not just the amount of money you brought in, it's the amount of money you brought in less deductions. So your adjusted gross income has to be $75,000 or less. You can make up to 99,000 and still get something, um, but it's a prorated amount, discounted 5% for every $100 above that $75,000 mark, phasing out fully at 99,000. Um, couples just have double the amount. So if you're married filing jointly, you get 2,400. Um, if you've made 150,000, full phase out at 198,000. If you file as head of household, you can make up to 112,500 and get the full uh, $1,200 check. So that's who's getting it. Amazing. And then there's, um, if you have dependents or you have small children, right, who were uh, alive and kicking in 2019, <laughs> how does the stimulus uh, impact them? So you get, for every child under age 16, you get another $500. But okay. they had, you had to have listed it on your tax return. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about semantics and operations here. So just to, you know, I've, I've had a lot of those sent to me. If you listed your, the fastest way to actually get your check, if you haven't filed 2019 and you're below that 75,000 or 150 if you're married filing joint, I would encourage filing as soon as possible and listing your checking account on your actual tax return so that mm. the money will get auto deposited. Um, in terms of checks, you will get physical checks. Obviously, it takes longer to get physical checks out to everybody. If you yeah. haven't filed tax returns for a period of time or you don't file tax returns, right? So that, that's a segment of the population who, you know, just gets a small amount of Social Security or something like that or SSDI, uh, disability income that doesn't file because they don't have a reason to. They'll get them. It'll just take longer. Perfect. So, Veronica, you... you, you you beautifully like shared tons of information, but you, you, you glanced over something strategically that I think is important. This is a very important yeah. value add by something that Veronica just shared, right? So she, she shared a lot. And then, and then I want to really zero in on this one thing. So let's say hypothetically, Veronica, tell me, tell me what the result is. Hypothetically in 2018, married couple together filing jointly uh, made $300,000. So this is, they have pretty good jobs. Um, their adjusted gross income is somewhere around two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Could, for based on their two thousand eighteen tax return, would they expect to receive a check from the individual stimulus? They would not. All right. If you earn more than one hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars as a couple, you will not get a check. Okay. So in two thousand nineteen, they have a child, and um, one of the spouses decides that they're going to work from home and they're going to live off a single income, and so now. On their single income, they're adjusted, uh, their, their salaries total $150,000. Mm -hmm. 
but their adjusted gross income, the deductions, then bring it down to about $100,000 in 2019. Do they expect to get a, a, a check? Yes, they will actually get $2,400 plus $500 for their new child. So, so they should absolutely file their 2019 tax returns. So ready, red alert, right? Everybody full stop and pay attention to what Veronica just told you. Everybody's talking about, oh, I don't have to file my tax return until, uh, you know, September, well, whenever it is, right? July, so August, July September. 15th. Don't have to worry about it. Got my 2018 in. Now I get another 90 days. I don't want to file my tax return. But what happens if your 2019 tax return has you at an income level where you'd actually be getting a check from the stimulus in your 2018 wouldn't? So it is a, it is a, you know, there's this procrastination mentality, right? And I don't, I, I'm not judging. That's just, it just is. You've delayed it. You've pushed it off. You don't want to file your, your 2019 tax return because you don't have to. And now you've missed out on an individual um, uh, stimulus. And so, and so, you know, just, just to put this out there into the universe, you know, some people may judge you and they go, oh, you know, you make $150,000, $200,000. You're not the person that the stimulus is targeting. But what the purpose of the stimulus is, is not to give checks to this person or that person, the rich or the poor, or, or anything along those lines. It's to give money to infuse capital into the economy. And so it doesn't matter who gets it, as long as they are you know, paying their rent with it, they're buying groceries with it, they're shopping on Amazon with it, they're paying contractors to repair their roof. Uh, on their house with it. Whatever the purpose is of the individual stimulus, getting that money into the economy is what's needed to put to, to give life support back to our economy. We really, really want to get that pumped up. So from a it, from a tax perspective, file your 2019 tax return if you think that it's going to put you into the target of the stimulus. Don't avoid it just because you can push off. Is that good advice, Veronica? Yeah, definitely. And I do want to add something in regarding 2020 tax returns. So what this stimulus check actually is, is a tax credit advance. So mm. I think a lot of people aren't catching that. If in 2020, you earn under that amount, and you didn't in 2018 or 2019, you will actually benefit once you file your 2020 return. So if you've lost your job, for instance, and now your income or your income has been significantly slashed for whatever reason, and now you will fall under the income limits for your 2020 returns, you'll actually get money back in 20 for you, when you file your 2020 return as well. Amazing. Thank you, Veronica. So, so I think we've pretty much covered what people need to know about the individual stimulus program. Do you think it's fair for us to transition now into a little bit of a conversation about unemployment? Absolutely. So, so walk us through it. What have been the most profound changes? The, the, the three things that people need to take away from the conversation today, what are the most profound changes you would say to, to the way unemployment is operating now? Right. So unemployment has been massively expanded. So most importantly, it now includes 1099 self and self-employed workers and nonprofits and nonprofits as well. So you can actually um, benefit from unemployment. Um, if you are self-employed or 1099, I've had that question come up a lot. The second major thing that it does is add $600 per week to existing unemployment benefits across all states. So just keep in mind, every state has a different unemployment program. So you have to check with your state what the rules are, um, but it does add an automatic $600 to whatever the states are currently paying. And it also expands the length of you getting that check by another 13 weeks. So normally unemployment lasts 26 weeks, they've actually expanded it to 39 weeks. So those are the big, you know, three major changes that I would Beautiful. say. Beautiful. And so, um, you know, you have the news now talking about this, Veronica, and I'd love for you to react to this. You have the news that is, you know, pandemic, outbreak <laughs> alert, right? Like breaking news every two seconds. And they're, and they're screaming from the rooftops, this is the most catastrophic, you know, uh, uh, impact on the economy. Look at the new filings of unemployment rates as an indicator of how messed up the economy is. Have you seen that like on the news? I definitely have, you know, I saw that surge. I think we've all seen that graphic of like that last week, the numbers came out um, yeah. of, you know, $3.2 million of people filing for unemployment. 
it's really clear why, right? I think. Wait, 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 wait. It's very clear to you. Wait, go slow. It's very clear to you. Yes. So what is so clear? Point out, if you're not allowed to go outside and you own a boutique or you own a gross or you own, you know, uh, a real estate agency, or even if you own a real re uh, retail store, you're not allowed to go outside or restaurants, right? All of these people for all of the restaurants and bars and everything else, which were some of the first that were shut down, are now unemployed because these life is just different now and hopefully temporarily, right? Um, for, for all of these people, that's why they're filing for unemployment. Right. And there's, there's also, right, included in those numbers, and this is such an important takeaway, there's also included in those numbers, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to say that people are not impacted, right? Let me be perfectly clear. But the numbers, the numbers of filings are true, right? But numbers don't tell the whole story and you have to be discerning, right? This is part of the, the shaping and influencing outcomes, right? Because the news wants you to be tuned in and listening to what they have to say. So they need to have sensationalist titles. They need to be doing these things because otherwise you'll switch off the TV and you'll go outside. So yep. Veronica's 100% dead on that the numbers don't lie. But there's a way to interpret the information that's being provided to you that is so critical. And that is that there's a lot of employers who are saying, wow, I have a staff that is either underemployed or unemployed. And so what am I going to do? Am I going to keep them on the payroll, right? And not be able to support them ultimately? Or should I furlough them or lay them off temporarily knowing that when the economy comes back and we hope that it all comes rolling back uh, and, and roaring back, um, I'm just going to hire them right back. So everybody is filing for unemployment because even if they're being underpaid, let's say they're only being utilized 20% of the time, or they're being paid half of their salaries, because of these new um, programs with unemployment, they could be making more money on unemployment than they were when they were fully employed. And we, we want that, right? Because if they're bringing in money and they have a check coming to them, then they're putting money back into the economy. They're buying produce. They're able to live their lives. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. But also, you know, some of the uncertainty that's created by the economy is shot and it's dead and this is all over and look at what coronavirus did to us is based on numbers and an interpretation of those numbers that's not exactly accurate. Is that, is that fair, Veronica? Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of people, look, there's just businesses that are uh, physical staff heavy that are not remote staff applicable. You know, we listed some of them like restaurants and bars. There are others, right? Like, just because I need you physically, but there's nothing for you to do for me remotely. And I want you to earn something since you're my employee. And I, you know, I can, as soon as things open, you're right back to being physically needed. But right now it, it's not like that. So yes, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's just a matter of circumstance, right? And um, it's a beautiful thing that the government has actually pumped this money into the economy to help so many people because, you know, we're all social distancing until further notice. So it, it's a wonderful way to um, help the people who are, you know, physically unable to do what they normally do. Beautiful. And, and there's, there's one other interesting facet before, before we transition, if that's okay with you, that I want you to explain um, to the listeners related to um, unemployment for the self-employed. So, yes. you know, this is, this is revolutionary, right? Essentially. Um, what is, what does that mean? Right. What is unemployment for the self-employed? So unemployment for the self-employed is super interesting because it also includes the gig economy workers, right? Which is kind of like the latest trending term, but basically like if you were a delivery person for DoorDash and because there aren't that many deliveries going on, you were actually self-employed or part of the gig economy. Mm -hmm. Um, and because there aren't that many deliveries happening, for instance, in your area, now you can collect unemployment based off of your average earnings, your highest two paid quarters as a DoorDash employee, for example. That's right. That's Same right. thing if you were, uh, you know, this is coming up a lot in the marketing space. If you're a graphic designer or a consultant or something like that, and businesses are just not in need of your consulting services at the moment, you get paid for a, a, the average of your two highest quarters. So I think it's, it's huge because previously in the past, 
um, you had to have been employed by somebody as a full-time W-2 employee to be eligible. But now if you've earned and claimed your own income, like you've just gone out and done, done odd jobs of any kind, you're eligible to receive unemployment based on your previous earnings. It's a massive shift. Yeah, so how, how about this one? Ready for this, Veronica? <laughs> how about surgeons and doctors? right, that are self-employed and doing surgeries and now, you know, their facilities are being shut down um, and they can't work. They're self-employed, they're, they're medical providers. Um, you know, they're saying, wait a second, I can file? Uber drivers are going, wait a second, I can file? And the answer is yes, like there's certain conditions that you can meet, but is it fair to say that if I was an Uber driver, I can file for unemployment? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And there's one more added exception. It used to be that you needed to work for at least a year um, or at least six months in certain states um, to, to get it. And that's actually removed as a restriction as well. So technically, actually, if you just started Uber driver in January 1st, 2020, you would be eligible for unemployment. Yeah. And not only that, um, you know, New Jersey has a requirement of 21 weeks. Um, so that's a little bit of a shorter time frame. Um, you know, then, then the one year period, that's, that is a, that's a, the six, the six month that Veronica was referring to, but even that, according to the governor of, of New, Jer New Jersey is actually going to be relaxed as well. So Veronica's dead on beautiful. We've touched on the individual stimulus. We've touched on unemployment. Of course, um, we're available that if anybody needs additional questions answered, um, please post them, please give them to us. I saw a question by, uh, one of, one of our attendees, um, Jessica here. And she had asked, hey, look, if you're a W-2 employee and you were a 1099 employee, so you, you, did, you had two gigs, you were getting mm -hmm. paid a 1099 on the side and you were also a W-2 employee, um, employee, can you file for both the W-2 loss of employment and the loss of your 1099 employment? So it would be combined. So you would combine your earnings and file as if that was your total income during yeah. the time period. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's not a ton, Jessica, there's not a ton of, of um, guidance on this, as with most, most things. Uh, the more information that comes out and the more changes that are being made, the more we have questions and don't have all of the answers. Of, of, uh, but, but we are in the process of gathering as much information as possible. But I think Veronica is dead on with regard to that response, that you would combine your incomes and file for unemployment uh, with a combined income, and that would be what you were losing, and that's how the state would uh, quantify how much you're entitled to under the state program, and then it would be supplemented with the new federal stimulus of $600 a week, and then plus, 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 whatever is allowed um, per your state. So yeah, I agree with Craig. Jessica, that was an excellent question. I'm sure a lot of people um, had that. So we talked about individual stimulus. We talked about unemployment. Let's touch a little bit on the business stimulus, because there's a lot of talk about it, and I want to keep it as, as 50,000 foot view as humanly possible, because I don't think the SBA has yet released um, information on what all this looks like. I know the banks were meeting on Monday going, what do we do with this thing, right? Um, so to the extent that you know, and let's try to like drill a little bit deeper, because we have a lot of folks who are very curious about filing um, their SBA loans. And we have a lot of people who are pulling the trigger really soon. And they go, oh my God, where's the SBA application? And they're filling out applications. And they don't even, you know, they don't even know if this is going to be read, when it's going to be read, whether they're going to get money, when they're going to get money. What advice, what are the top two pieces of advice you could give to people that say, there's $350 billion. I need to get a piece of that because my business is suffering. I don't have revenue coming in. What are the two biggest pieces of advice you could give them? Yeah, so I would say no, the, the number one advice is know your numbers when you're doing the application. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, I, I know this has been thrown around a lot. There's a maximum of $10 million that you can get as an SBA loan through this bill, but it's not like everyone is welcome to $10 million. It's just the max on the loan. The actual loan you get is 250% of your payroll numbers, right? So just keep that in mind. It's, it's whatever you've previously paid. It's, it's a paycheck protection program. It's not a, you know, help me stay profitable through this time program. Um, the other thing that um, I, I would just keep in mind is be patient. Um, it's a huge bill. It's a huge stimulus package. Um, like you said, the SBA is kind of trying to figure out what to do and how to handle the influx of loans that will definitely be coming in. Luckily, if you're an individual that's been furloughed or um, laid off because of it, you're 
your employer will actually not be penalized if they hire you back. They'll still be eligible for the loan for the full time period. So there's a good chance that a lot of people who are furloughed or laid off um, during that time will actually be hired back as businesses start getting their loans. Beautiful. So Veronica, do you, um, you have a couple more minutes. Um, yes. I don't want to take too much of your time because we have a couple of questions that are out there and I want to try to get some yeah, answers to, to, to the folks. So question number one, and, and I think Veronica and I are both going to struggle to answer this question as okay. would 99.9999999999% of the people who should know the answer, but obviously can't. When will the checks under the individual stimulus officially arrive? When can we expect this money to come through? Apparently, they're getting printed on April 6th. So according to the latest numbers, so when it will actually arrive depends on the United States Postal Service, how long it takes them to, you know, mail it, like just keep that in mind. I would say, look, when you file your taxes, right, it takes anywhere, you know, three weeks to six weeks to actually get your money back if you're getting a physical check. That's why I'm actually encouraging everyone, if you haven't filed your 19 returns and you're eligible, file your 19 returns, include your address and your, I mean, include your checking account for direct deposit um, or direct withdrawal, if you, even if you owe a little bit, because it'll help you get it that much faster. Beautiful. Um, next question, uh, is there enough money to go around? So individual stimulus, business stimulus, um, is there enough money to go around for everybody? So if everybody says, hey, I need $500,000, will the government goes, here's $500,000, right? And, and that's a legitimate calculation of what um, they would be entitled to or, or entitled to request. Is there enough money to go around? So the calculation was done, not, it's not pulled out of thin air, right? I think a lot of people, you know, we all think that this was done in a hurried manner. If you look back on tax returns and remember that um, the government has all of this on file, you have a deduction on as a business you put in when you file even your schedule e or your business tax returns you're actually putting in what your payroll costs were so it's not like an out of thin air number they did the math on small businesses under 500 employees how much would it cost to cover everyone um keeping in mind that you know there's some people who may not even go for it i i definitely think there's enough money to go around and we live in a beautiful country where the treasury can always print more boom so <laughs> I, I was waiting for you to say that veronica and you, you <laughs> that's that's what's referred to as burying the lead so yeah i mean there's always going to be enough money um <laughs> because the treasury will just keep printing it forever and ever and ever the yeah. challenge is is that when everything is said and done and they've printed so much money the value of each dollar that we have in our pockets goes down. And so this happened in other countries where there's a period of hyperinflation and it can get absolutely out of control um, and, and downright scary. There were, there were stories in communist Russia where you would have to bring a wheelbarrow full of cash in order to buy bread, right? So mm -hmm. today we pull out a fiver, right? And you get a loaf of bread. But in communist Russia, you'd have to pull out a wheelbarrow of cash to buy bread. <laughs> and so what we don't want to do is print so much money that it creates something like that happening. And so there's this delicate balance that has to be struck to make sure that we're not creating a dangerous economy to come into. So yes, there will be enough money. Yes, they will keep printing it. The, the harm is a period of hyperinflation. Uh, I don't want to get into that because it's super complicated, the whole nine yards, and I am definitely not qualified to answer that. Though, before I began my career as, uh, as an attorney, um, I was actually a uh, finance and investments major. So, you know, I got my, um, my, my, my BBA from a B school before I went to law school. So, yes, I could talk about that all day long, but that's not the purpose of this. And if I did, um, our wonderful leader would probably smack me and tell me to stay in my lane. So I will stay in my <laughs> lane and only address legal issues um, on this. So another question we have is um, from Dustrin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thanks for this. Thank you, Dustrin. What are the requirements to ensure my loan will be forgivable? Can I furlough or do pay cuts uh, up and th uh, through June? What if there are people I let go and I don't want to hire back do I have to hire a replacement employee? So Dustrin has obviously been reading um, his material right. to the point where he is, he is strategically making the, the decisions. So Dustrin, um, I can answer every single one of those questions. And so can Veronica. 
I yes. think the challenge is that we'd be making assumptions about what your position is, how many employees you have, what industry you're in. And I think that those are really, really, really um, dangerous questions for anybody to be answering. So the answer to your question, right, with, the, with a thousand caveats of we can't really answer it with the information that we have available to us is what are the requirements to ensure my loan will be forgivable? You have to have as many employees as you started that when you ended during the, the relevant time period. Is that fair, Veronica? That's absolutely fair. So the amount of loan that gets forgiven is equal percentage wise to the number of employees that you retain. That's the information we have in terms of, can you lay people off and replace them? Can you cut your staff in the meantime and then rehire back? We don't have the details on that. You're absolutely right, Mike. What we do know is exactly what's written, which is if you keep your employees percentage wise at the same amount between these two dates, your loan will be forgiven based on the number of employees you actually retain. Yeah, the, the number of employees. And this is so important. And this is me in my lane, ready? Yeah. There's a principle in law called statutory interpretation, right? Of, of how you interpret statutes. And that's what this thing is. It's, it's a law, right? As laws are read and interpreted by courts and also by other government officials like the commissioner of, uh, of labor, um, and things of that nature, they begin to interpret the law and they, pro they, they, they create codes. And codes give you more detail and more information, more interpretation. Those codes don't exist for this law. This, this law is barely two business days old, right? So there's no code. And so the code would give you more guidance than the law itself. And then as the law and the code begin to evolve, you have judges that begin to interpret what the code and the law mean. And so you can read the law and say, this is what the law is saying, but the code is different and the interpretation is different. And then there becomes a whole battle of over, over these things. I think appropriate guidance at this point in time is listen to the spirit of what this law was designed to do. And the more you begin to strategize, right? And, and, and read the four corners of the, of the uh, uh, law and interpret it the way you want to interpret it and maybe the right way to interpret it, I think you begin to enter into a danger zone. I, I categorize these things as green, yellow, and red. And so if you follow the spirit and the word and the, the letter of the law, then you're in really good condition. You're in the green territory. When you start to strategize, you're entering into yellow. When you start to strategize on multiple interpretations with your assumptions, now you're in the yellow, red, orangey zone. And the minute you start breaking the law, red, right? Red. So Dustin, the best way I can describe it to you is yes, there's strategies, but if you'd be well guided by interpreting both the spirit and the letter of the law and operating within that. So I hope that was, um, that, that had answered your question. Uh, we have another question from Darcy and I, I got to keep it tight folks. Um, I'm going to try to get to as many questions and any question I can't get to today, me and Veronica, right, just for the purposes of today, we're going to jump in and we're going to be able to answer all these questions at least uh, before our next, uh, next um, uh, panel or whatever we're, we're describing this. What if a real estate agent, right, this comes from Darcy, Darcy, thank you for the question. What if a real estate agent uh, is still selling, but sales dramatically are, are, and drastically are reduced? Can we still file for unemployment? Veronica, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are yes, but what income you earn will be taken into account for whatever you get from unemployment. So remember that unemployment is not really a percentage of your assets, you know, I've had of your income. I've had this question come up. If I earn $200,000 now, will unemployment now cover me for $200,000 plus 600 a week? It's not how it works. There's a cap on how much you earn. So you would, assuming you make not enough to what the, your state deems as necessary, you would get subsidized by unemployment. Um, but it's not meant to make up your entire, you know, total income pay gap, let's say. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dustrin. Uh, how about wages? Have to keep at 100% of pre-corona uh, wages. Um, what if they are on staff but have taken a pay cut and or, uh, or are furloughed? Veronica, let me try to deal with this really quickly. There is a provision, I think what you're referring to is if I get an SBA loan and then I go for loan forgiveness, do I have to keep them at the same wages of what they were earning before? 
And the answer is uh, within, the, uh, within the loan forgiveness uh, portion, there's actually some uh, statement about a 25% reduction that they're making about 75% of whatever they were making before. We don't know yet how to interpret that. We haven't got an SBA guidance on it, so we don't have a lot of clarity. Veronica, fair to say that there's something built into loan forgiveness, which we're going to get more guidance on that says you don't have to pay them the exact same amount of money they're making before. Yes, there, there are obviously provisions made for, you know, what I'll call common sense provisions that they've tried to include within the law, just saying like, look, we know that obviously if you are making less, you can't afford to pay as much, but you can't cut workers down to, you know, 25% of what they were making and say, you know, they're still employed. So I should get loan forgiveness. Beautiful. So I agree with you. Hey, so we have a question from Shannon. Um, Shannon, uh, you know what? I, I feel like this is a question more appropriately uh, answered by Peter. Peter, can you, are, are you here? Can we, um, can yep. you unmute yourself? Yep, I'm here, thank you. Um, so first of all, Veronica and Michael, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm not thank even you. in America and I'm learning stuff, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, so Shannon, this is a really good question. And what I want to talk to is not the detail of the stimulus, but the intent of a stimulus because it, it's called a stimulus, not a personal care law for a reason. Because what the government are trying to do at a very, very high level is just ensure liquidity. Um, that, that really is what this is about, is making sure money carries on flowing from buyers to sellers, from households to businesses, so that the economy doesn't literally go to zero. Because if that happens, it can't ever be restarted. Obviously, yes, there's an element of looking after people inside that, but, but, the, but the bigger goal is at a macro level looking after the, the whole thing. So what I wanted to say about this was this is the exact reason that we formed Hack Mankind and that we tried to bring amazing people like Michael and Veronica on board to talk about these things. And we did the group call with Amanda earlier um, because we agree with you. We agree that local businesses and artisans and merchants need our support right now. And we believe that we should be slightly more conscious in our capitalist decisions right now. And that when we come out of this in three months, we don't need to revert to Coca-Cola versus Fentimans. We don't need to restock CVS overnight. That, that We can use this as an opportunity as a as hat mankind and as that ripples through to our larger broader communities to inform some social change there is an amazing opportunity in this as much as everyone has you know is focused right now on how do i pay for groceries how do i pay my bills how do i put a roof over my head and those things obviously need to take precedence there's another thing that can be done here which is go what world do we want in three to six months you know, right. I, I use an example. If, if we all had to go into nuclear bunkers because you know, we had that end of world scenario, we'd have had no choice as to the world that we came out to at the end of that period. We have somehow managed to give ourselves a situation where all of our infrastructure, all of our expertise, all of our smarts is still in place. And yet we still have that opportunity to go. There are dolphins in commercial ports in Italy. Do we, do we like dolphins? There are <laughs> fish in Venice. There's we can actually make choices. So I can't blame the federal government for unfortunately, fortunately boosting Amazon and deliveries right now because they're going to employ people and people will then be able to feed their families. That's the nature of this. And at a government level, that's all you can have tried to do. But as communities, as individuals, we need to be taking it on ourselves. Um, and obviously my plug for please to anyone that's on this call, come and see us at www.hackmankind.com and help us build that future world. Beautiful. Thank you, Peter. So Veronica, final words, final thoughts based on our discussion? Final words and final thoughts uh, is the thing I keep telling everyone. This too shall pass, right? Everything that the government is doing is well calculated. It's strategic. Um, it's, Everyone is trying, it has the same goals. I think, you know, just get out of this healthy, focus on your health. Um, all of these provisions are in place um, to be as helpful as possible. And then also the second is find the silver lining. You know, there's a lot of us that are struggling there, but there's a lot of opportunity. You know, I mentioned this at the start of the call is like, 
are, are you right for a right, uh, an IRA conversion to a Roth IRA? These simple questions and like buying the stock market when it's down so you can sell it when it's up, you know, all these things, just try and find what's good and, and know that, you know, um, there are resources out there to help you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, again, Michael Smiken here from, for Hack Mankind, your relentless guardian. If you have any questions, we are going to answer them before the next um, panel. So again, thank you so much for all the love. And, uh, and Veronica, thank you so much for being here. And Peter, thank you for putting this all together. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.